Hey there, I want to talk about myths and misconceptions in science that tend to persist. Basically, the background for this is that I recently read some papers, I'm going to give the citation in the comments in the description, um, that listed some common misconceptions, for example, one in my field of mycorrhizal ecology and one that was more in microbiome research. And it was uh, rather stunning how many myths and misconceptions have persisted in our science, but also have been basically shared with the public. And so now they have also become myths and misconceptions in public perception. Both of these topics actually have in common is that they really capture the public imagination or the imagination of people. And so therefore they are susceptible to kind of a hype, like there is an, an increased interest in anything that comes from that. And so therefore this is, I think, maybe the breeding ground for some of these myths and misconceptions to get out there and to also persist. It also makes me wonder how many of these myths and misconceptions I am basically also have adopted myself and I'm not critically questioning at all. But let's talk about first why it is important to sometimes critically check what we take for granted in science. Well, the first is an obvious reason. If we, for example, are emphasizing a certain research field or a certain process or organism group or whatever it is, uh, but in the end this is not as important as we thought, then that basically leads to a dead end and a lot of wasted research effort. Conversely, if the myth is about this is not important or this plays no role, but in fact this is important and it does play a role in ecology, let's say, then we are sort of closing some avenues for research just because we have discounted that as an important topic and that is just as damaging to the progress of science as the other version. The second reason why we should question um, some of those myths and mis misconceptions is that once it's been in the public domain um, and it kind of takes on its own life and later on it comes to be questioned, then then this can sort of create a lot of confusion in, confusion in the public perception of that science. Like it means like is it like this or is it like that or is this important or is it not important and it's very awkward and you know damaging to the reputation of science in the public eye. So like the pendulum can swing a lot, like in one particular case about the importance of common mycorrhizal networks, are they important or are they not important? This has been already woven into many stories that it is important when then it turns out, well, the evidence base is actually rather thin for this to be true. Then, you know, the pendulum can swing back potentially and say like, well, what they have been, what they've been telling us so far, these scientists are just fairy tales and there's just basically nothing to it. Of course, it would be much better if the uncertainty were woven into these stories as they are being communicated in the first place, but sometimes this kind of nuance gets lost along the way. But um, this is also why it's important to regularly check some of those commonly held misconceptions and make sure that they are corrected. The third reason why it's important to question these um, misconceptions is that it can actually really be a career boost. I think that there can be diverging opinions on that. <laughs> um, some people might say this can be um, like a drawback if you are the one basically that calls into question somebody's pet theory. This can be damaging for your career. I can see that happening. But I think I see more the rewards, like if you are the person to debunk a commonly held misconception that a lot of people have been pursuing, I think there are rewards waiting for you. So I think it is very good to seek out these opportunities when you have a feeling something hasn't been really well supported, but everybody kind of claims this to be true or not the case, <laughs> then I think it can really be a career boost to actually tackle that question. And I think this is a very good incentive. One question that we can ask ourselves is why do these myths persist in the first place? And some of these misconceptions, like going back to the common mycorrhizal network example, they just make beautiful stories. They're beautiful stories of something nice in, in nature where plants help each other via their mycorrhizal partner. So it is an appealing story. It is a relatively simple story. It's one of helping, <laughs> it's a bit 
anthropomorphic. So I mean, it um, it we can it helps us relate better to <laughs> organisms that are quite foreign for us, like plants and fungi. So they basically just make nice stories. This is why they tend to persist, and they don't just persist in the public domain, but they also persist and keep getting repeated and also cited in the scientific realm. This is important to realize. I'm not just talking about the public domain. I'm talking about how some of these myths and misconceptions get perpetuated also in the scientific realm. So people will always cite these papers in support of that. And um, that leads to um, these myths just always being basically seemingly confirmed because everybody cites and talks about it in a certain way. So reason one, because they are simple stories, they are compelling, and often the truth is inconveniently more complicated and more nuanced than that simple story, and therefore the simple story is more likely to persist. The second reason I think is a more pragmatic reason. I mean, as we work in science, we have to build basically on what's already there, and it is completely impossible, I would say, or at least unproductive if you were to question every single little <laughs> statement that you for example cite in the introduction is simply impossible to always follow up on on everything you just take some things for granted as you do science you build on what's been done before and so you cannot every time check the evidence base for every statement you have. You just have to at some point rely on something probably being correct. But of course, as we mentioned above or earlier, it's, it's important to really every once in a while critically step back and ask, what if this is not true? The last thing I want to say here is that that is actually very hard. It is very hard to ask, what if this is not true? Because even though, you know, we always try to uh, falsify things, in, <laughs> at least in theory, the way science usually is done is we have a particular story in mind and we try to find support for that story. And so we very often do not, even though we should, <laughs> very often we do not actively ask, what if this is wrong? So maybe we should ask that question, what if this is wrong? more often. And what I'm thinking about <laughs> right now, and maybe this is also a future video, is like in my particular area, what are common myths and misconceptions or things that we keep repeating or keep hearing in the public domain, um, in newspapers and magazines that are very clearly not true or that they're at least very, very poorly supported. Maybe this is a good moment for all of us to pause <laughs> and think about what some of those misconceptions in our respective fields might be. And then to ask, what if this is not true? And I think this is a lot of fun to think about. I hope you find something in your field, a myth and a misconception that's commonly held that you can debunk. And I hope it will be a career boost for you because this is also how science progresses. With that, thanks for listening to this. Let me know in the comments what you think and see you in the next one. Bye.